So in our walk, in our Christian faith, we're going to have times where we feel like we're on the mountaintop, and there are going to be other times we feel like we're in the valley, right, Paul? <laughs> right, rolling around in the valley, right? So, so some, there are going to be times like that, and sometimes maybe we're in between those two places, but we can tell which direction we're heading, and sometimes it's not the direction we would prefer to be going in. But there are mountaintops and there are valleys, and here, what I want to tell us this morning is this, sometimes we struggle to respond to either one of those locations very well. We're going to have mountaintops. We're going to have valleys. We often really struggle to respond correctly to either one of those two places. Normally, when we're on the mountaintops, what do we want to do? Hey, let's just, let's just stay here forever. Let's just stay here. But do you get to stay on the mountaintop, yes or no? Eventually, but not yet, Right? And then sometimes when we're in the valley, we can be throwing our own little pity party, can't we? Not Paul, but like others, right? We can be throwing our own little pity party sometimes. We can, we can kind of think, well, this is just, it's never going to get better. It's, or I'm just going to be stuck here forever. And, and we can really kind of get down on, we can get down on the Lord, we can get down on ourselves, we can get down on our family, we can just get down on life, and we can really struggle. Sometimes... I think Christians struggle with the mountaintops and the valleys and how we should respond. But we of all people have reason to respond to both of those settings the right way. There's a song by a guy named Torrin Wells. And Torrin has a song that's called Hills and Valleys. And it's, it's the God of the hills and valleys is the idea. And part of the chorus goes like this. I want you to listen to this. It says, on the mountains I will bow my life to the one who set me there. In the valley, I will lift my eyes to the one who sees me there. When I'm standing on the mountain, I didn't get there on my own. And when I'm walking through the valley, I know I am not alone. And it says, God, you are the, you are the God of the hills and the valleys. So you need to understand this morning, we have a God who is God of the hills and valleys. Well, we see in Matthew chapter 17... Three disciples have been with Jesus, and they have been on the mountain. The other disciples didn't go on the mountain. They've been in the valley, and neither one of them responded really well. It's not going very well for anybody. It's a really cool experience for the three disciples who are with Jesus, but they don't really respond well on the mountain. And then we see the disciples that are still in the valley. They're not responding very well in the valley, and then at the end, they get alone with Jesus. And this is where we're going today. Are you with me? All right, so first blank, ready? First thing we're going to see, we're going to see confused disciples on the mountaintop. Confused disciples on the mountaintop, all right? Matthew 17, let's read verses 1 through 13. We'll focus really kind of on verse 4, 5, 6, something like that, all right? Uh, Matthew 17, 1. After six days, Jesus took with him James, uh, Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking to him. Now imagine this scenario. The deity of Jesus that has been veiled by his flesh to some degree is now seen. And these three disciples see this, and it is amazing. What would you do if that had been you? If you had been up there with Peter, James, and John, and you see this. You see Jesus, Moses, and Elijah in, in at least semi-glorified form. How are you responding? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not sure. Am I, am, I, am I just like dumbfounded with my mouth hanging open catching flies? Am I face down on the ground? Am I shouting running around like a charismatic with a church flag? What am I doing, right? What am, there's, there's lots of different, and ne- none of those necessarily would be bad. I'm just curious kind of wonder what you would do. wonder what I would do. We know what Peter does. Peter is so excited, he doesn't know what to say, but he has to say something. Right? You ever been there? You, you, you have that person in your family. You, you have them in your family, don't you? They, they're so excited, they don't know what to say, but they are going to say something. All right? All right? Matthew 17, look at verse 4. Look at what Peter says here. Peter says, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. I'm so glad. It's good that we're here. That's what he came up with. It's good that we're here, right? Thanks for bringing us. It's good that we're here. And then he go, Peter says this. Peter does what we would be tempted to do. And I'm not throwing rocks at Peter, 
Okay, no pun intended. <laughs> Get it? Okay. The dad jokes are coming this week. Okay, that's just that's going to happen. I didn't plan that. It just happened. Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now listen, what Peter is saying here, can we just stay right here forever? Oh, how are we going to get food, Peter? I don't know. Hadn't thought that far ahead. Can I, I just want to build a place for you to stay and for each of them to stay. And we just, the three of us want to be here. Well, what about all those people down in the valley? I don't care. I just want to be right here. And that's our temptation. See, Peter is confused, and what he's confused about, he doesn't really understand the purpose of the mountaintop experience that he's having. And often when you have a mountaintop experience in your walk with the Lord, often you don't fully understand. We, I'll say we, we don't fully understand the purpose of that mountaintop experience. Look at verse 5. He was still speaking... When behold, a bright light overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay? So, Peter has to say something, and God, he doesn't say shut up, but in my head, that's what I hear, right? Stop talking. Just listen to him. Don't listen to you. Listen to him. Okay? Keep reading. All right? Uh, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. I bet. I would, we would too. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, and you just, we'll get here, but you know that you always have to come down the mountain. You, you always have to come down the mountain. Keep reading. And when they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And of course, we know that they did because we're reading it right now, right? And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was, talking, he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. So they see Jesus in at least some level of glorified form. There is no doubt in their mind that he's the Christ. There's no doubt in their mind that he's the Son of God. None whatsoever. But they start thinking on the way down the mountain. You ever do that? Well, hold on a minute. Right? So they do this, and they ask a question. Right? They start doubting in the dark what God told them in the light. Right? You ever done that? When things kind of get dark, things kind of get difficult, you start moving off the mountaintop, down in the valley, you kind of start doubting what God clearly spoke to you. So they're not doubting Jesus' deity, but they have some questions. And it's okay that they have questions, and they do the right thing with their questions, don't they? They bring it to Jesus. When you have questions, when you have concerns, when you don't understand, bring it to Jesus. But trust the answers from his word. Don't make up your own answers. Okay? So they bring them to Jesus, and their question is, hold on. They know the scriptures. They know that when the Messiah comes, there had to be a forerunner to prepare the way for Messiah, that Elijah would come, the forerunner. And Jesus says, well, he did come. You guys just didn't recognize him. And then, they're, oh, John. And they get it. Okay? So, the first point, that we have confused disciples on the mountaintop. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, let me back up. The problem here is that Peter and the other disciples, Peter's the one talking, we'll give him the most credit, good and bad. Okay? They misunderstood the point of the experience. I misunderstood the point. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could come into the presence of God. Well, guess what? Now, because of Jesus and the Spirit of God, we are now temples of the living God, the Spirit of God. If you have trusted Christ, the Spirit of God indwells you. He resides in you, right? He is in you. And so you don't have to go to a place to worship. Remember Jesus talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well? It's like, You don't have to go to a place to worship. The Spirit of God is in us. Now, we are commanded, though, 
to gather together. And when we gather together, sometimes that, when we're singing these truths, when we're singing these praises to God, isn't it a blessing? Don't you love singing God's word back to him? Don't you love singing the truth of God and praising him for who he is, praising him for what he's done? Is it just me? Don't you love that? Okay. Well, it can feel like that mountaintop experience, but what's the point of the mountaintop experience? Even as we gather, what's the point? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 talks about this. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about this. It says, Therefore, brothers, starting in verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, in other words, we don't have to go into the, the temple the same way. We've, we've got, because of the blood of Jesus, we get to enter into the presence of God. Actually, the, the presence of God has come into us. Verse 20, it says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Remember, Jesus dies on the cross. The veil in the Holy of Holies that was so strong you could put oxen on each side of it. They couldn't pull it and tear it apart. It's torn from top, torn from top to bottom, signifying all who have faith in Christ may enter into this presence. Right? So, let's talk about that. So, verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God... Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So there's lots of of priestly um, tabernacle like imagery here and the sprinkling of the blood. We've been sprinkled clean. We've been covered by the blood of Christ. We've we've been cleansed by the by the washing in the word, right? We've been cleansed by the word of God, okay? So there's lots of of, uh, temple imagery here. Now verse 20. Three, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And as we gather in those, these moments where we are together and we are celebrating, we are praising God, why are we doing that? Why do we gather? Like, why do we gather? If we are the temple of the living God, why do we gather? Well, we're commanded to gather And part of the purpose in that gathering is this. Look at what it says in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir one another, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, especially in the summertime, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In other words, part of this mountaintop experience if you want to call it that is that we would gather together to spur one another on to love and good works i want you to listen we praise god on the mountain and we take joy and pleasure in that so that we are prepared to go and fight the devil in the valley this is what's happening here and this is a picture of, of what it looks like to follow Jesus. That, that you're going to have these, these moments that the Lord is encouraging you, that you are with brothers and sisters. Haven't you had those times where brothers and sisters in Christ, and you just like, because you're around them and they're around you, you just l- feel like you just love Jesus more? You feel like, oh, I just want to go tell people about Jesus right now. Let's just run out and let's go, let's go for it. The, the purpose of those high points in your walk is not that you would stay there, plant a flag, and never move. Because as long as you live this life, you've got to come down the mountain. And there is an enemy in the valley. And we're going to see that here in just a minute. Let me, let me do, put it to you this way. So my older boys, um, and, and Lord willing, the, the younger two get to be a part of this as well. They're just not old enough yet. My older boys are part of a, uh, a couple of different like, homeschool like, sports teams, okay? We had a really fun experience this week. We got to play some, uh, some other, our JV football 7-on-7, seven seven, got to play some other JV like, public school football 7-on-7s, seven sevens, and it was, it was, here's why it was fun. The other three teams um, really thought they were just going to wipe the floor with us. Only 15 of us were able to come, and we kind of slaughtered everybody. It was a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. There's no tackling, so it's not like we hit or anything like that. Seven on seven is just your pass defense against our pass offense and vice versa. So there technically is only six of us counting a quarterback. So seven of you on defense against us, we had so much fun. It was good. But one of the things that they miss in being a part of this program that, that I got to experience in public school, and maybe you got to experience this too, 
is a pep rally. Have, don't you love a good pep rally? Those of us old enough to remember some of that stuff. Like the band is in the gym and they are rocking and the whole school's in there or maybe you're on the field or wherever you did that. And it's like, I mean, the tuba's going. My, one of my best friends played the tuba and you just feel that low end, the drums. It just, it's, man, it's just exciting. And you're just like, we're going to kill whoever they put in front of us this week. We're going to kill them. Right? Doesn't matter who it is. We, we'll tell them about Jesus after the game, but during the game, we're going to kill them, right? And you're all pumped, and you're excited about that. Well, some of us, we come to the pep rally, but we never go to the game. Some of us, this is kind of like the pep rally. This is not the game. When we think this is the game, we get frustrated about, well, how come they did that like this? How come we did this like that? And we start nitpicking all this stuff about the pep rally. There's a game right out there. There's a game right out there. Put your jersey on, strap up your helmet, and let's go kick the devil in his teeth. Because he's caught people. He has caught people, and they have no hope, and they're looking everywhere for it. They have no joy, but they're looking everywhere for it. And the, way, the places they're looking for it, they think it's going to work, and it actually makes things worse for them. But you and I have the answer. We've got not just the playbook, we have answers Come to the pep rally. But only so you're ready to go to the game. Hello? Come to the pep rally, but only so you're ready to go to the game. So these disciples, can we just stay at the pep rally? We just want to stay at the pep rally. The pep rally is exciting. The game is scary. Sometimes we get hit. Sometimes we get injured. Sometimes we get tackled. Sometimes we fumble. Sometimes things don't go our way. Yeah, but who wants to come, yeah, and then go home? Who wants to do that? Let's get in the game. Let's get in the game. So number one, we have confused disciples on the mountain. Number two, we see powerless disciples in the valley. We see powerless disciples in the valley. Look at Matthew 17, verse 14. We'll go 14 through 18 here. Ready? Are you with me? Okay. So when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures. And he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? Now, he's not lamenting the man. He's actually lamenting the disciples here. All right? How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Okay, so we know we have to come down the mountain. When Jesus and the three come down, they walk into a scene. They walk into a scene. Here's what's happening. There's a dad who has come to the other disciples, and he has a son, and this son is tormented or possessed. We're not sure to the full degree, but a demon is affecting this young man. It's affecting him to the point where it's causing him to have seizures and it's throwing him into fires. Imagine this little boy and the burns that would be on his body. It's causing this little boy, as they walk by water, to throw himself into the water. Imagine, like you, imagine in, this, in this time in human history, the only heat you have during the night is a warm fire. And every night lighting a fire going, is my son going to be thrown into this by this, this demon that's oppressing him, that's possessing him? Imagine every time you go to draw water, is this demon going to try to throw my son in here and drown him and kill him? Parents, imagine the state that this man is in. Then he hears about Jesus. He hears about his disciples. They're healing people. They've, he's brought people back from the dead. Maybe if I get my son to him, they'll heal him. They take the son to the disciples. The disciples are like, yeah, we can heal him. And they, they do 
they pray, they put hands on them, however it was that they, that they did that, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so Jesus walks into this scene, but something else is happening here, and in a different gospel, it tells us in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, I think it's coming up here, something else is happening. Uh, this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an extra detail that's in Mark that's not in Matthew. Okay, here's the detail that's in Mark. And when they came to the disciples, talking about Jesus, James, and John, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Sounds a lot like social media, doesn't it? All these Christians just arguing and yelling at each other. Right? There's a game out there, but let's argue. Okay? And we can all be guilty of that if we're not careful. Okay? So, this is kind of what happens. So when Jesus... And the three walk down the mountain. They walk into this scene. There's a broken dad. There's a tormented boy. And disciples publicly arguing with other religious people. Sounds like a whole lot of fun. So we see these powerless disciples in the valley. See, the disciples are failing at their calling. The disciples here are failing at their calling. They've been given power. They've been given authority. But they are unable to heal the boy. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Look at what it says. It says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over how many demons? All demons. And to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. They have the power, they have the authority, and they are failing. They are failing in their calling. See, the mountaintops are fun and exciting. But we can't stay there. Because there are people in the valley, and they need what we have to give them. But we can often be just like these disciples. We can often be just like these disciples. We confuse the point on the mountaintop. We even get mad because we can't stay up there. And then we get to the valley where the rubber meets the road, and instead of doing what we've been called to do, what we've been commanded to do, what we've been empowered by God to do, we argue with people. We complain. We complain about how hot it is in the valley, how there's no wind down here, how all these stinky people are here, and I wish it was just us and our friends and Jesus and Moses and Elijah and all the other people would just go away. And then we miss the opportunities God has for us. Listen, when people complain about the brokenness of life, you know that that's an open door into the gospel. Did you know that? It's not fun that this world is broken, right? It's, it's not fun that our kids are, are becoming, some of us, like products of this broken, like it's, it's, we don't want that for our kids. We don't want that for ourselves. We don't want that for our family. We don't want that for our friends. We don't want to have to work for a boss who seems like he or she is out to get us. It doesn't seem fair. We live in a broken world, but guess what? When someone complains about how messed up and broken our world is, that is nothing but a large open door with flashing lights over top of it for the gospel. Because here's what you say. Ready? You, you know, it, that does stink that, that it's like that. Have you ever thought about how things got that way? How, how, did, how did all this brokenness come about? Have you ever thought about where that came from? Why, why, why is this happening in our in our leadership, in our country, in our state, in our city, at our job. Why is all this crazy stuff happening? I can actually, I actually know why. Do you want to know why? And so we tell them. And then, you know what we do? We say, but there actually is a, is a cure for all this brokenness, for all this sin, for all this, for all this evil. There's, there's a cure. Do you want to know what that is? Well, the cure is that even though we have all, we've, it's broken because we broke it. Our ancestors broke it, their ancestors, and we all, we broke it. That's why it's broken. But, you know, there's a cure. And that cure is that the Son of God came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if anyone will turn from their sin, putting their faith in him, it's not going to make everything perfect in this life, but there is a life to come, and in that life, everything is perfect. And in the midst, 
of all the brokenness that you live in now, you can have joy. You can have, you can have peace. And you can have hope. Who, would say, who in their right mind would say no to that? Hello? So guess what? Yeah, there's valleys. And valleys, valleys are open doors. Valleys are opportunities. But we're so often confused about the point of the mountaintop, we wind up being powerless where we need to be powerful in the valley. If you get the mountaintop right, you can stand better in the valley. If you get the mountaintop right, you can stand better in the valley. Here's point number three. Ready? Lastly, we see maturing disciples in the secret place. 19, 20, and 21. We're at the end, right? 19, 20, and 21. Look at what it says. It says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? They don't understand. Right? They don't understand. So Jesus cast out the, the demon. They're perplexed. They don't understand. Listen, you know what they've done? They have taken what worked in the past and just applied it here. I, I bet they prayed the same pretty much prayer. It worked back then. Why didn't it work here? I bet they did the same things. If they touched them, if they, if they surrounded them, if they laid hands. I, I bet they did the same exact things, but it didn't happen. Why? My perspective is and Jesus, Jesus says this in just a second. My perspective is they got lazy in their faith. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Follow along here with me. Follow along here. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. He didn't say they had no faith. If you have a translation that says that, it's not a good translation on this verse. Okay, Because you have little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, let's get into this real quick as our closing, all right? Sometimes we are, uh, when we are failing in our calling and when we are fighting with our critics, just like the disciples were, we just need to get alone with Jesus. When we're struggling in our calling, have we, we have all been called. Do you know that? I am not the only person in this room who's been called to ministry. Hello? I'm not the only one. We have all been called and commanded by God himself to make disciples of Jesus. We have all been commanded that. We have, we, you've been called. If you didn't know that, you know now. Okay? You have a calling from God. Otherwise, just practically speaking, why didn't he just take you to heaven as soon as you trusted Christ? Just get up here. Don't, don't sin anymore. Just get up here. Well, he didn't do that yet because he still has purpose for you. He's got a call on your life. Well, when we are struggling in our call and when we are fighting with our critics, the answer to fix that is stop complaining and get alone with Jesus. Get along, and this is what the disciples they come they come apart privately and they get alone and they're saying, oh, Jesus, what's going on here? They're confused here because they've done it before. They prayed the same prayers, they did the same things, and it didn't happen because their little faith. Jesus speaks about little faith multiple times. A couple of times he speaks about it. One, he says, when we worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, we have little faith. When we live anxious lives it is an evidence of our little faith not no faith but it is evidence of our little faith philippians 4 even talks about it that, that was kind of a reference to the sermon on the mount right philippians 4 even talks about the peace of god that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in christ jesus if we will instead he says be anxious for nothing what's nothing Nothing, right? Nothing is nothing, okay? And if you, just sidebar, if you happen to be an evolution, evolutionist in here, your thought is that nothing made everything. That doesn't make any sense. Nothing can't make anything. It's nothing, okay? So, back to here. 
be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It uses four words even for prayer. When, listen, you are going to be tempted with anxiety. You are going to be tempted to worry, right? Because we realize no matter how much we try to white-knuckle our lives, we are not in control of everything that happens to us, right? I've got a son, he's about to get his license, okay? When he was three, and he drove around our house and his little scooter thing, you know, like the little, you sit on the toy and like push with your feet, it was way easier for me. It was way easier for me, because I could control, I could put gates up, you could go here, you can't go there. There's no other drivers, right? In a few weeks, he's going to be turned loose on Forsyth County. Listen, I'm praying for y'all, okay? He's a, he's a great driver. He, he's, he's driven a ton, okay? He's a great driver. But I can't control everything, can I? I can't control what other drivers are going to do. I can't control, Lord, we've taught him, but I can't control, is he going to pick up his phone and look at it when he should not be touching it at all? I can't control that, Right? Well, guess what? You can't control everything in your life either, but guess who is in control? The Father. And even when rough things happen, when bad things happen, because God gives people the opportunity for free will, guess what? He's in control. Y'all pull that down a little bit. That's a little strong. This is like, this is like at the end of the award ceremony when the speech is going too long. It's like, play the music! right? Jesus speaks about little faith there. And Jesus speaks about little faith when Peter got out of the boat and he's walking, but then he starts looking at the waves and then what happens? He starts sinking. But guess what Peter did? He's the only one who got out of the boat and walked on water. Part, he walked part of the way. Pretty good. Pretty good. And Jesus didn't say he had little faith when he was walking. He said, he, he said he had little faith when he was sinking and then he asked for help. Jesus got him up. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Some of us, when we're struggling in these ways, when we're struggling on the mountain, when we're struggling in the valley, we need to understand, we need to get along with Jesus. We've got LFD. We've got little faith disorder. And what we need to do is understand that we can have saving faith but still struggle to have sufficient faith for the moment. These disciples, they needed bigger faith. Jesus wasn't with them. Peter, James, and John were not with them. And what they had done is they were leaning on yesterday's spirituality. They were leaning on yesterday's time with God to give them what they needed for today when they needed today's time with God to give them what they needed for today. They were resting on their past strength. They were resting on their past experiences. They were resting on their past in their walk with God. And, they, and it was like, we can get this way, can't we? Like, well, but look at what I've done, and I'm good. I'm good with God. And then slowly, what do we stop doing? We go from being in our Bible pretty much every day to maybe a couple times a week, maybe. And we pray, but it's only like in front of a meal. And there's never really any intentional time with the Lord. And guess what? Even when there is intentional time with the Lord, we're still going to have battles. There's still going to be hills and valleys. Right? It doesn't make the hills and valleys go away. But what it does is it gives us perspective in both. You need to think about your walk with the Lord and your faith. You need to think about cultivating it like you do a plant. Uh, when I was in middle school and high school, my stepmom had two plants. She named them. Anybody ever name your plants in your house? She named them. She was, she was fun. She named one of them Seymour, and she named the other one Sea Less. Because Seymour 
looked like he was doing pretty well. C. Less looked like he was on his last leg, right? Well, what was the difference? Well, the difference was at some point, Seymour, he got water that he needed. He got better soil. He got the right amount of light. C. Less, for some reason, we just, I, we didn't have a green thumb at that point, okay? It's really good at killing plants. Okay, maybe it was the rock music. Anyway, some of us were strugg- We're wondering, God, why am I struggling? What is going on? I just feel dry. I don't feel like close to you. I'm, I'm just like, I feel like there's just something off. Maybe it's not him. Maybe we've just kind of tapered off. Did you know that we have a church-wide reading plan? Did you know that? It's just five days a week, but the reason we have that is because, listen, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And we need the message that is in these pages. These are the words of God. We need them. You know what else we need? We need to be able to talk with God. Like, his word mainly is him talking to us, right? Well, guess what? We need to pray. This is, of course, you're going to say that. You're a pastor. Read your Bible and pray. Well, there's a reason we say that. Because it's what we need. And if we do this, it will encourage and help cultivate our faith. Instead of fasting and praying, these disciples thought, we could just, we got the formula. We got the formula. I, I want to say this, and we're almost done. Ready? One of the worst things you can do in your walk with the Lord, in your serving the Lord, is to begin to think you can do your job. One of the worst things you can do, because when you think, oh, I can do this. I've, I've led Sunday school so many times. I've taught children's church. I got it. I got it. What happens is you stop leaning on the Lord. You stop spending time in the Word. You stop praying leading up to it. And then the hand of blessing of God starts to go, okay, if you don't need me, see how you do without me. Just see how you do without me. Or we can lean in on the Lord, to get alone with him, just like the disciples do here. And they go, hold on, what happened? And Jesus, well, you you had little faith. Why'd you have little faith? I haven't changed. What happened? We need to cultivate our faith. We may begin with little faith, but if we cultivate it, just like Jesus said back in Matthew 13 about the mustard seed, and it grows into a tree, You may feel like I'm starting with just the smallest little seed in the world. But by the grace of God, if we cultivate with the word of God, by the spirit of God, with the light of God's word and amongst the people of God, it can grow into something that literally it talks about that tree of the mustard seed. It talks about the tree that it grows into and it compares that tree to the kingdom of God that all kinds of birds come and nest in. We want to see people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, from all different ethnicities come to faith in Jesus. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. Cultivate the seed by the grace and power of God. And let's see what God will do. Get alone with God. Read, pray, sing. Be that weird guy in the car with the worship song. I'm serious. On your way to work tomorrow. Turn it up. It's your own car. If it's too loud, you're too old. Let's go. I'm serious. Like, heaven's going to be loud. Look at me. Heaven's going to be loud. Sing. Praise. This is how we'll close. Ready? Julie's brother is a crazy person. Okay? I love him. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. He's a crazy person. That's part of why I love him. Because we get, we, I get it, right? I get it. It's a couple Christmases ago, Julie's brother 
Julie's dad asked for a flashlight, okay? Like, he's very low maintenance for Christmas. That's what he wanted for Christmas, a flashlight. So John can't just get a flashlight. That's her brother's name. That's Julie's brother's name. He can't just get a flashlight because he, dad, dad was like, get me, like, a flashlight, just something I can use in the yard, a decent strength, whatever, just 30 bucks and we're good. John finds a $350 flashlight, and it's not a flashlight. It's like a self-defense flashlight. It's one of these lights, like, it's like staring into four suns at the same time when it turns on. So it literally is designed for self-defense, okay? It's LED, um, and so that way the battery doesn't die immediately, okay? It's rechargeable, but he bought her dad this flashlight. Now, he bought himself one, too, because dad can't have a toy that I don't have, right? That's his perspective, okay? They're sitting on the couch at Christmas. Julie's dad is opening this gift. John is sitting across from him on the couch, but over a little bit, and John has his own flashlight, the same one. And he's, it's like, if, if, it, if, if I had it, I wish I had one right now, just to blind all of you, right? You'd have to wait 20 minutes before you could drive anywhere, okay? Because you couldn't see. But like, he lifted it when dad wasn't looking for a second, and I couldn't, I was, it was spots for three minutes, okay? So, Julie's dad opens this. John has his turned on, but dampened and pointed down at the, at the, at the couch, okay? Julie's dad opens his, and he's like, what is this? It's like a weird shape. It's got a weird grip. It's funny looking because you've got to have a place for all this battery strength. He's like, I just wanted a flashlight, John. And John goes, I got you one and lifts his up and it's on and no one can see. I'm dead serious. No one can see. But then we start smelling something. John has burned a hole in the couch. It's an LED light how an LED light got that, I don't understand. He had it on there for maybe 20 seconds. There is a hole. It looks like a lightsaber has shone through, has like stabbed through this couch. Okay? Okay. Now, if Julie's dad and her, and Julie's crazy brother John, if they go in the backyard and they've got their flashlights on for a while, and they do that for a couple nights, what's going to happen to that light? eventually. What's going to happen? It's going to get dim. It's going to get dim. They have all the possibility in the world to have the brightest, most obnoxious light anyone has ever experienced, anyone has ever seen, but if they don't recharge it, it will eventually get dim. See where I'm going? Get recharged in the Word. Get recharged and get alone with Jesus. Not so you can be the obnoxious light, but so that you will be a bright one. So that you will be a bright one. Listen, you have everything you need to be the light God's called you to be. You're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. You have everything you need. But some of us, we need to plug in say, God, I need, you to, I need you to fill me up. God, I, I need your presence. I need, I need to be more connected to you. And you have been here this whole time, but I have been distracted. I have been anxious. I have been worried. And God, I've just kind of been dry. And I don't want to be that anymore. So God, I'm plugging in. I'm getting in your word. And guess what? One day is not going to get you charged all the way, but it's going to be a start. So start one day at a time. And trust God to brighten your light. Let's understand the mountain. Let's have power in the valley because, because we have been in the secret place with Jesus.